Hello. The subject for this video will be ethics. Um, specifically though, I would like to uh, do what I can to present a, sort of by way of introduction again, but I would like to present a survey of some of the different approaches to ethics that we will be considering uh, during this course. And I thought it would be helpful to I thought it would be helpful first to prevent, uh, present this overview so that as we move through these different theories, um, they will somehow, they will be vaguely familiar. It will be something like visiting, um, maybe visiting old friends. Um, and, uh, and so I, I thought that I would attempt to organize this survey roughly chronologically. Now again, when we're talking about, uh, about the subject of ethics, um, we're not exactly talking about uh, what we should do, or what, uh, uh, do this and don't do that. Um, rather, we're, we're, uh, we're much more concerned about the basis for making that judgment in the first place. Uh, um, this is a question that will continue to come up uh, during this course, but I, I introduced it in, in the lecture, the prior lecture, which was the question of these, these two kinds of intelligence, and the one basically uh, finding, uh, uh, dis discerning and, and discovering ways to get what we want. Um, the other one, though, uh, um, determining what is worth wanting in the first place. Right, so the first one helps us get what we want. Uh, the second one, uh, the second order intelligence, helps us want the right things. And in ethics, uh, when we're studying ethics, that's the kind of intelligence that we're, um, we're especially concerned with. Um, partly because it's it's unusual uh, for in our ordinary lives to consider uh, questions from that second order perspective, but so this is an opportunity for us to practice and to develop in this kind of thinking. And so again, we're not we're, we're much less talking about um, do this, don't do that, and instead we're searching for the basis uh, that that makes something worth doing in the first place. Um, this is much more challenging. In fact, um, a philosopher called Schopenhauer. Arthur Schopenhauer, who, uh, whose name uh, may be familiar to some of you. Um, he has a, a, a famous, a famous um, quote from, from one of his essays on the foundations of morality, and, and he says, he just uh, makes this observation that it, it's very easy to preach morality and, and it's very difficult to find a basis for it. And so that is in some ways the challenge that we're confronted with. Um, but so we're, we're going to do the best we can given this challenge. Um, it's important uh, to, to, uh, to try to meet this challenge, and, and the reason is because, um, because, uh, because in, in case that, that people disagree about, about uh, what is the right thing to do, what is the good in a, in a given situation, um, the only way to really resolve those kind of disagreements is to uh, identify what, um, what is the basis for those judgments in the first place. Um, it's a way to escape just arguing, basically just a shouting match, right? It's a way to enter into a, a, a dialogue. So in order to enter into a dialogue, we have to have a sense of, of uh, well, what we're really talking about. Um, just to give a picture of, of um, well, by analogy, often an, an analogy can help to clarify something that's perhaps quite abstract. Um, you can think about it like this, where, um, if we're looking for the springtime, uh, what does the springtime look like? Well, somebody might hold up a, a flower or a bud or point to the blue sky or uh, the sunshine or any number of things. Um, now, it's clear that none of these individual things uh, itself is the same thing as the springtime. But they're somehow uh, not exactly instances or examples of the spring. That's not the right way to think about it, but they're... Um, they're all, um, in some ways, they're related to one another, even though they appear totally different. And they're related kind of under the ages or under the auspices of this, um, uh, of the fact that it's, they're, they're kind of signs of spring or they're expressions of spring is one, is a, a way to look at it. Now, um, this is, uh, actually a, a very close analogy to the one that, that Plato uses in, uh, in one of his most famous, uh, and memorable, uh, memorable excerpts from all of his corpus. Um, Plato, uh, Plato gives the image of, of the, the ascent 
out of the in, in the parable of the cave, the ascent towards the sun, and he says the sun itself it's a symbol of the good, right? And so uh, he has this idea. So in a similar way to um, the 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 way the good is uh, kind of one one single thing, uh, but it it it, uh, it gives light to everything else, or it, it reveals uh, everything else. Uh, in a similar way, we're looking for a theory of a single theory of ethics, or maybe not a single theory, but we're looking for an understanding of ethics that allows us to um, basically recognize all of its uh, all of its expressions, right? So we're looking for basically we're, we're um, we are joining Plato in in his quest for uh, attempting to um, to to get to know uh, the good, right? And clearly, this is not a straightforward undertaking and, and we're going to do the best that we can over this course um, but it's of course uh, it, it, um, it's something that that um, that uh, there's no limit to how far we can pursue it that being said uh, any little bit that we pursue it will um, in some ways uh, um, well every little bit matters we can just say that and and um, and, and don't uh, don't feel that you have to take my word for this um, uh, rather, um, you may see that this is the case, and, and what I mean by it matters is that it, it helps us to um, to see new aspects of our lives and to see uh, new dimensions of our lives that that before it's not that they were there, it, that not that they weren't there, but it's that we um, we didn't know how to look for them, and so with ethics we're we're attempting to um, to find ways uh, to find uh, theories of ethics that help us uh, perceive. Um, what makes something good, right? It helps us perceive value uh, in our actions. Um, and so, so again, um, only only if we know what this uh, we only if we have a concept of the springtime. Only that allows us to recognize the sunshine, the blue sky, the buds, right? The flowers. Uh, these things. It allows us to recognize these things as expressions of springtime. If we didn't know about, if we didn't have the concept of springtime, we might see all of those things, but we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't know what they meant in that sense. We wouldn't understand the meaning of them. Also, in a similar way, uh, we all, uh, you know, live, abide by and, and, and act out certain principles and certain values. But with this course, we're attempting to um, formulate a theory or a concept that allows us to see how all of those actions that we do, that before they seemed. Uh, totally dissimilar and, and just kind of um, completely atomistic or fragmented or unrelated, it's going to, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, attempt to formulate a theory that allows us to see the relation of all those things. So they be, we, we're able to, uh, they become meaningful, right? And our actions become expressions of these values, right? And we're able to see that connection. Um, Plato's, uh, Plato's parable of the cave is, is maybe a good place to start because um, in, in this now, I'm, as I turn to what I described as a sort of a roughly chronological survey of various different, um, different uh, pro uh, theories that, that famous thinkers have proposed that are attempting to do just this that I described. Um, if we think of the time before Plato and before Socrates, this is, uh, again, it's close to 3,000 years ago that we're thinking, so um, this is very, the very distant past. Right? Um, Plato was writing roughly 2,500 years ago. And so if we think of a time before that, this is, uh, again, very, very distant from us. And, um, but the fact that we're still reading Plato uh, and we can still find meaning in Plato's, uh, Plato's work you know, today, it suggests, um, well, I guess it, 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 helps, to, it, it helps to show why, why Plato was somebody and Socrates. So Plato is always, Plato is, uh, he's, he's writing through the mouthpiece of Socrates. So Socrates is his, um, his, kind of his most famous protagonist from all of his dialogues. And Plato was, in fact, the student to Socrates. And Aristotle was the student to Plato. Um, and so we will uh, have an occasion to read Aristotle. And, and, and Aristotle, um, I will, I will uh, say a few words about Aristotle in this survey that I'm now going to uh, attempt to present. Um, we think of a time before Plato. Uh, it's uh, and this is we can actually go go to staying in the Greek tradition. Uh, Plato is coming out of a, a, a tradition of um, this kind of uh, heroic uh, 
warrior ethic. And Plato is, Plato is frequently quoting Homer. And Homer was a, a poet that, that, again, lived roughly 3,000 years ago. Um, and uh, he's famous for these, these epic poems, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And these, in some way, uh, and every, every culture has their, their analog for these, but they're, um, they're kind of, they're epic poems. Uh, they present all the pantheon of Greek gods, etc. But what they do is they, they also present these um, uh, different characters that uh, they kind of em embody ideals for that given culture. Right? So they become like role models. If we think of a contemporary an analog, we might think of something like, um, I don't know, uh, someone, someone like Abraham Lincoln, or someone like um, Rosa Parks, for example. And these are people that are, they kind of, they almost assume a myth mythical status almost because they, they have symbols for some kind of virtue. They're moral, moral paragons for something they did, or, right? And so similarly, uh, for kind of tribal cultures, they share this story. Um, they share this story, and that gives them a, a, some, a, common, a common set of, a, a common role models to emulate. And basically, you can, uh, just from before Plato's time, it's safe to say that in this kind of tribal, uh, tribal ethic, it's basically a question of uh, right, filling your, fulfilling your role within the tribe, within the family. We again, we could appeal to our own, uh, our own childhoods within a family. This is very obvious. The question of ethics is, is it's totally a question of knowing your place, right? Um, so to, uh, to, to be ethical means uh, to basically, um, Right? If you're a child, you, you have a different role than a parent does. And if you're a younger brother, you have a different role than an elder brother has, etc. Um, we also see that, that uh, generally from this, this kind of pre-Socratic ethic, um, it's kind of uh, uh, ethics or morality. It meant something close to um, basically help your friends uh, harm your enemies. Right? So to do the right thing is to help those who are your friends and to harm those who are your enemies. Um, part of the reason that, that Plato represents such a pivotal moment uh, in this kind of development of, of what we're going to see as something like a development of thinking about ethics is that um, Plato basically introduced this uh, different way of thinking about it. And again, he, he did this through the, um, from his, uh, his tutelage uh, under Socrates and, and also through the mouthpiece of Socrates. Um, Plato kind of uh, helped to transform this notion of help your friends, harm your enemies, to um, rather uh, something more like harm no one, right? Um, in other words, uh, and, and the way that Plato accomplished this is he, he kind of turned the question back to ourselves, and, and it was, it's more a question of um, if I harm somebody, I'm also, uh, how would I say this, the way that Plato would think of it is I'm I'm making myself worse because I become I become a sort of a, a, a violent person, right? Um, another way another another way of uh, thinking of ethics that Plato is so so originally and and so uh, evocatively introduced was uh, the this um, the way of thinking about ethics where we we think about um, we think about ethics as being free uh, from from our own, yeah. well, I guess for Plato, the, the real key of the, that, that unites all of these different, seemingly disparate things about Plato is uh, he's looking at, at uh, ethics as a, a question of, of um, perfecting our own souls, so becoming in harmony with our, within our own minds and souls. And so Plato introduces this idea or presents this idea that um, in the kind of disorderly soul where uh, where uh, things are just out of joint, uh, he gives the, the, the picture of um, of a of a chariot, right? And 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 he, and he says, in some way, we should be able to to guide the chariot of our own souls and bodies. But he says, um, in a case of disorder, and this would be unethical to him, it would be uh, kind of straying from the good. Uh, he says, our own uh, our own desires. He likens these to the horses that are pulling the chariot. He says. Uh, they will basically take charge, right? And so we have the often we have the notion today of 
of liberty as something like being able to do what I want. And this is um, largely, uh, also Plato so convincingly shows that in some ways, um, in some ways we are the least free, We're the, the, we have the least liberty when we act as we please. Right? Because, and, and that sounds so counterintuitive, but, but allow me to try to explain. Um, when we act as we please, often uh, we're acting according to some desire. Right? So what I want to do, what, I please, what pleases me to do, uh, it's something that I, I uh, a, a desire uh, that I'm seeking to fulfill. Now Plato presents this picture that helps us to see that often it's in fact the desire itself that is uh, putting us under compulsion to, to act it out, right? And so think about, if we can think about it like this, where um, uh, many of our desires are desires that we might, um, again, from this second order thinking, we might not really want to have those desires. In other words, we don't choose our desires. In some way, they, they, uh, uh, they sort of force themselves upon us, right? And we can think of all kinds of examples of, of, uh, when we have the, the urge to do something that we would prefer actually not to have that urge if it were up to us. Um, maybe it's something like eating ice cream or chocolate cake or whatever it happens to be. Um, there, there, you can, I, I imagine that everyone has uh, sufficient imagination to really uh, color this concept with, with specific examples that could be meaningful to you. Um, whenever we uh, basically find ourselves incapable of um, acting according to, uh, according to what we might imagine to be uh, unideal for ourselves. This is an example of what Plato was talking about, where, where uh, we are somehow under the bondage of our own desires. And so Plato, so with such originality, he introduced this idea that um, the true freedom and the two, true, truly uh, um, perfected soul is the one that is able to, um, again, not get what it wants, but it's the one that's able to want the right thing, to wish for the right thing. And so uh, for Plato, it's, it's much better, uh, in fact, it's, it's much better not to get what we want. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's much, much better to, uh, to first learn to want the right thing. And, and in fact, until we've done that, we're better off not, get it, not getting what we want. This is really revolutionary. And again, it accounts for the fact that we're still reading about, we're still reading Plato, we're still talking about Plato today. Um, Plato, I, I guess, uh, presents something like a bookend. And uh, another selection that you read for this first week was something like a bookend on the other side, which is close, much closer to our time. Um, and that is Nietzsche. And you read the, the parable of the madman in uh, a selection from one of Nietzsche's books. And in this, he kind of, um, he kind of plays off Plato's image of the, the one, the single, singular good, the good in the symbol of the sun that we all share. We all look at, the, we all perceive the same sun, no matter where the person is on earth, um, right? What, whatever is the person's condition or social status, etc. We all look at the same sun. And this is Plato's idea that, that there's a kind of a singular good, right? That we can all, uh, in some ways, um, strive towards. Nietzsche is coming at a time where this uh, kind of belief in a, a shared uh, transcendent uh, source of value is um, beginning to fragment and beginning to deteriorate. Now Plato came, uh, Plato with such originality uh, expressed this uh, kind of, again, revolutionary notion of, of uh, what it means to be good and what is, uh, what is a virtue, what is ethics. Nietzsche, again, uh, with just as much originality and, and foresight in some ways as, as Plato, um, he, kind of, uh, he kind of introduced us or um, he um, in some way sounded the keynote for the, the age that we all, um, well, that we're, we're, we're living in today, that, that we're all speaking from today. I would characterize that as um, something like a skepticism of, this, of the, the belief in a singular uh, a singular good, and and we know this because um, in in a, in a traditional tribal culture, for example, everyone would share the same 
Um, I gave the example of the Greek cultures with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, in any traditional culture, every member of that culture would share the same, um, well, cultural sources, the same upbringing, the same stories, the same, uh, um, yeah, values, etc. The same metaphysical underpinnings to the, the way they think, the kind of place they think the world is. Um, we no longer can count on that today. We, we, we can't count on the fact that somebody with whom we're speaking um, uh, believes that, uh, for example, um, imagine, imagine, uh, imagine two people attempting to um, come to some agreement about, about uh, like Schopenhauer said, the, the, the difficult question, which is um, not preaching morality but finding a basis for it. Um, suppose somebody believes, suppose somebody is a, a fervent, um, devout uh, Christian, uh, Christian uh, believer. Suppose somebody else is a, a fervent believer in, 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 in the, the kind of cosmology of physics. Um, these two people are going to have very, um, they have such profoundly different concepts and conceptions of what uh, reality is, what kind of place the world is. Um, that this is just a, it's a very difficult situation that we find ourselves it's a very challenging situation um, the consequence of, of the fact that we don't sh uh, sh we can't assume that everyone we speak to shares the same uh, the same uh, basic underlying beliefs that we do uh, the result is that we have to be much more we have to be much more uh, discerning and, and uh, careful to um, to really uh, understand what is the what is the basis for for um, for for our beliefs, right? And uh, and again, the, this goes back to if we have a disagreement, um, we want to be able to uh, to move that disagreement from a shouting match and transform the disagreement into, into dialogue. And ideally, um, both both parties can help uh, illuminate. A, a, the similar situation, even from such different sides. Um, that's um, so. In some ways, we can we can now returning to this kind of survey of, of various ethical theories. But keeping that in mind, what we're trying to do is not necessarily say um, each of these theories that I'm now going to present. We're not necessarily going to say that each of them contradicts the next one. But it's rather how do we? They're all in some sense trying to describe the same thing. But it's a question of whether we're able to um, understand how they relate to one another. Um, to bring in the, the, the parable that we are familiar with, the parable of the blind man and the elephant, we can think of it as a question of uh, how do we understand how the, the tail of the elephant relates to the trunk. Uh, they, if you describe each of them, it sounds totally different, right? Yeah. But we have some. Uh, we we are attempting to to uh, understand that connection. So again, it's quite a challenge, but, but uh, we, we understand now the nature of this challenge, and so um, we can, do, uh, we can uh, attempt to meet it in the best way that we're capable of. Um, so again, from before Plato and Socrates, uh, the notion of ethics was sort of assumed as uh, help, uh, help your friends and harm your enemies. Plato transformed it into um, basically harm no one. Right? Because, in, because in harming someone, you are uh, basically tarnishing your own soul. You're becoming a violent person. Right? Um, and again, Plato introduces this idea that it's, it's much better to, uh, to learn to uh, wish to want the, the right things than to get what we want. Right? Um, uh, Plato's student, Aristotle, he, uh, again, he, sort of, he developed Plato's ideas in a, in a very specific direction. And Aristotle int introduced uh, this, this theory of ethics that is still uh, very, very much, um, it's a very powerful presence even today amongst contemporary, amongst contemporary ethicists. Uh, it's often uh, uh, known by the, the title um, Virtue Ethics. And, and to, to explain where this title comes from, Aristotle really emphasized the notion of, um, of ethics as a, as a function of, uh, of character traits, character or character traits. And so when we think of, um, when we think of ethics, 
uh, for Aristotle, and, and he, again, he's, he's, um, he's kind of codifying or making more precise um, ideas that, that Plato introduced in the beginning. For Aristotle, the idea is uh, that uh, if we want to become more uh, ethical, to live a good life, um, the, what we should concern ourselves with is uh, becoming the kind of people that, uh, that are ethical, that are virtuous. Right? And so Aristotle identifies various virtues and, and traits of character. Um, and, and he presents, I think, as a very, um, it's very, uh, well, it's, um, it's quite practical and it's, uh, it can be operationalized in our own lives so effectively because Aristotle identifies the fact that um, a virtuous person is much more likely, it, it's much more likely to act in a virtuous way. And, and I guess um, to turn that around, we can say that the more, the more often that, that I act, for, for example, or somebody else acts in a virtuous way, the more likely uh, this person is to continue acting in that way. So Aristotle introduces what I think is, uh, it's, it's so useful, it's, it's this idea of thinking of ethics as um, uh, built through, uh, uh, through habit, through practice, through repetition. Uh, so Aristotle, is, uh, the word in Greek is, uh, Hexis. It's this idea of um, something that is established is likely to persist. Right? So uh, when we uh, when we do uh, when we perform one uh, virtuous deed, we're more likely we're in some ways instilling in ourselves the habit of performing that virtuous deed. And we know the the notion of um, repetition or, or practice makes perfect. And so for Aristotle, the question is um, basically. Uh, can we, uh, through practice, right, through a repeated, through repetition, can we instill these virtues into ourselves? Right, and um, Aristotle's idea is that the virtuous person will be able to, um, to respond to a given situation and a given circumstance um, by relating to the circumstance itself and not, and, and rather than uh, basically being under the under the sway of various various vices that we might have, which is basically the vice is uh, the deficiency of a virtue. Um, Arist one uh, so one very helpful notion that Aristotle introduces is is thinking of ethics in terms of uh, thinking of character in terms of habits. Another one that, that he introduces is thinking of virtues as um, not just sort of uh, opposite to vices, but rather um, as as means between two extremes. And so when we talk about a vice, we're not talking about something that's directly um, antithetical to a virtue. We're talking about something that is, uh, in some way it's a virtue tipped to one side or the other. Uh, the kind of, the iconic example for Aristotle is courage. We think of courage or bravery. Um, that's a virtue for Aristotle, but it doesn't mean just um, just uh, kind of uh, launching oneself headlong into dangerous situations. In fact, that's a vice for Aristotle. That's, um, that's something like brashness or just being uh, kind of senseless or cavalier, right? Uh, on the other side, it's, it's also not being a coward, right? So courage is between brashness and cowardice, right? And, and this is uh, such a helpful way to, to identify uh, in any given virtue to identify the two extremes uh, of which that virtue is a balance or an equilibrium. So we can think of it like the golden mean. So those are two, um, two very important contributions that Aristotle made to uh, thinking about ethics. And again, Aristotle, uh, in fact, recently, I think it's safe to say that, that Aristotle's uh, virtue ethics, his, his, uh, his systemization, or his theory of ethics, is amongst the most popular in contemporary um, in a contemporary uh, debate about ethics. Um, there are a couple others that are quite popular too, and, and we'll get to those, but uh, those are um, in some ways much, much closer to our own time. Again, Aristotle is, is writing in roughly the fourth century BC, so this is a long time ago, um, uh, 2400 years ago. But the fact that we're still, um, we're still repeating Aristotle's name and we're still learning about his, 
his theory. It's just a testament to um, to how how significant and, and how insightful it is. Um, moving on from. I presented Plato as something like a, a revolutionary figure. We can, in some ways, divide ethical thinking to the time before Plato and the time after Plato. Um, there's very clearly, and this is kind of a separate, we've been following the Greek stream of development. Um, this is kind of a separate stream, uh, but we could almost think of it as a tributary to a river that um, we find ourselves, uh, you know, very far downstream in the same river. Um, but kind of con uh, contemporaneously to Plato writing, uh, we had um, we had what is uh, known today as the Torah or the Old Testament, uh, and this is very famous for the Ten Commandments that that Moses receives from from uh, the the one God uh, from uh, the top of Mount Sinai. He goes up and he receives something like a revelation of ten rules of conduct, right? And so this is a very clear, um, you know, I, I try to describe very briefly describe Plato's view of ethics. I, I tried to very briefly describe Aristotle's view of ethics. Um, the uh, kind of uh, the, the Old Testament or the Jewish uh, Semitic view of ethics. Um, it's very, especially in the beginning, it's very, uh, very straightforward and very powerful because, because you'd, it's not a question of, um, of philosophical reasoning uh, or, uh, or argument or something like that. It's very straightforward. It's uh, it can be called divine command theory, and it's a question of uh, something is it, if we're asking the question of uh, what is the right thing, we always know what the right thing is. It's what God says to do, right? And so there's there we don't have to wonder about what the right thing is. It's a question of following the commandments that were laid down by God. Yeah. Now. Um, uh, again, so Plato was this very revolutionary figure. We can divide ethics to the time before Plato, the time after Plato. Um, I want to suggest, uh, just to give a sort of picture, these two separate tributaries. We have a Greek philosophical tradition, and we have a, a Hebrew, um, uh, you know, religious tradition. Um, these, in some way, uh, a second total revolution in ethics comes with um, the teachings of Jesus. Uh, Jesus comes and he transforms, again, Plato transforms, uh, help your friends, harm your enemies, to harm no one. Uh, Jesus transforms this in some way, again, to uh, something that's, that's even revolutionary for us today. It's very hard to understand this, this notion of, um, uh, that comes in, in, in the Sermon on the, sermon on the Mount, when he says, uh, uh, turn the other cheek, or um, if someone sues for your coat, give them your tunic also. Uh, so the idea is like, not only harm no one, but it's like um, help your friends and help your enemies, or love your enemies, love thy enemies. Um, this is quite, a, even today I think we sense, we sense what, what Plato means when we usually think of um, if we harm our enemies, uh, we might do that out of spite or uh, out of kind of revenge or, or, or vindictiveness. Um, and that happens, but we all sense that it's not exactly we w probably wouldn't call that a, a moral thing or an ethical thing to do. It's some ways, it's probably immoral. Maybe it's, it's at, at best it's amoral, uh, but it's probably immoral uh, for us. So I think that's, we've sort of assimilated uh, Plato's, uh, Plato's revolutionary views. Um, still, I think it's very, uh, it's very radical to think of what Jesus is telling us. Um, and, uh, but it's, uh, but, but I think it's, it's clear that, that, um, we all, uh, the fact that we're still talking about, we're still talking about Plato, we're still talking about Aristotle, we're still talking about Jesus, people know his name today, um, uh, 2,000 years later. Um, it means that it's still, uh, it's still a, uh, his, uh, his teachings, they are still, um, well, they're not, they, they still bear significance to us today. Um, in spite of, for example, uh, what Nietzsche, what, uh, what Nietzsche has said. Um, if we move, now we're going to begin jumping over centuries very quickly because, um, um, well, for a number of different reasons. Uh, the, I just, the, the theories that I'm presenting, in, in some way they are, I'm trying to present the most important ones, but another uh, criterion of selection that makes me select these ones and not other ones 
So one of them is uh, the most important, uh, or kind of the most significant, that shape our view of, of ethics today. But another one is, um, it's very difficult to present a, a view of ethics that is, uh, well, some, some views of ethics, they lend themselves to easy um, articulation, and, and they're, they're very memorable because they're easy. The Ten Commandments, for example. Um, I didn't need to spend any more than a few seconds just to mention them, and we all know, we all have some sense of what that means. Other theories are much more complicated. Uh, that, uh, in, in some way, even if they were good theories, they might be left out of this brief survey, and they might even be, they might even end up having less significance on, on history, and so they, they won't appear in our textbook, for example, just because they, they might be much more subtle and, and difficult to articulate. Now again, with a the theory of ethics, we're, trying to just, we're not trying to create uh, right and wrong. We, we, sort of, we assume that, that, that right and wrong or, or good and evil, we all have a sense for, that those things exist. We, we, uh, we couldn't really live without that sense. Another way of thinking of good and evil is we, we know that, that there are values. Some things are, our lives are not just uh, kind of like lukewarm, uh, all cows are gray at night, no differentiations. We couldn't live like that. Uh, instead, we, we are continually, we live in a kind of matrix of, of competing uh, and competing values. And, and, and um, really, if, if everything had a sort of equal camber to us, we wouldn't be able to act, right? Every time we act, we are selecting one, uh, basically one value out of, one thing to be valued, one object or one end, and pursuing that uh, at the expense of everything else that we might have pursued. Um, and so, so again, with a theory of ethics, we're not trying to invent a value. We're not trying to invent uh, good and evil. We're trying to um, articulate it. We're trying to come up with a way of, of describing the basis for it. Okay. And so, so now returning to this, this survey, um, it's, it's probably the case that, that, uh, that some philosophers or some thinkers have articulated actually very, very uh, accurate um, theories for, um, for these, these sort of, uh, for the basis for morality. But they might be skipped over in this survey and, and, and basically in, in, our, uh, in our whole, in, in, in contemporary thought about ethics, they might be skipped over just because they're, um, they're hard to describe, or they're very complicated. Um, and I, I think we'll, we'll see that as we go on, where uh, even if some of, our, some of the selections that we read, uh, some of the most memorable ones, or no, excuse me, some of the most, some of the most, the ones that seem the best, or that, that, that seem uh, the most, uh, yeah, the truest, they might actually be much less useful uh, to our, our uh, you know, underlying task of this whole course, which is to uh, come to a, a clearer insight into the, uh, or, or understanding of the nature of ethics, you know, the, the so-called elephant. Um, some of these theories, even, even if they're more accurate, they might not be as useful to us, uh, precisely because they're, they're, hard to, uh, they're hard to express, they're complicated. Uh, and so I, I do want to say that just because, um, just to be, because it's, be, just because it clarifies exactly what uh, the me uh, you know the the meaning of, of, of what I'm what I'm presenting here with this survey um, I'm going to just briefly mention Thomas Aquinas who was a philosopher from uh, from the the, the late, uh, high Middle Ages roughly 13th century I believe um, he uh, is famous for um, for uh, basically articulating this theory that's that's often called natural law and the idea for um, the idea for for Aquinas is that um, that there's a sort of uh, there are certain essential characteristics of of uh, being human now uh, that's deceptively uh, simple phrase because by essential we don't just mean um, important or um, or, uh, well, we mean necessary in the sense that if you took those characteristics away, you really wouldn't have a human anymore. Let me try to proceed by analogy. Um, suppose that, that with a cup, um, 
we don't often think about this, but if the cup had no uh, bottom, in some way a bottom is essential for a cup. And if you took out the bottom of the cup, it wouldn't really be a cup anymore. And you could tell that it was not a cup anymore because if you tried to fill it with water, um, it wouldn't fill with water. The water would go right through it. It would be like a funnel. Okay, so for Aquinas, there are certain uh, dispositions and, and certain qualities of human beings uh, that are essentially ordered towards the good. Um, one example is uh, for Aquinas, human beings are uh, they're sort of essentially social. Like they essentially, we, uh, as part of who we are, we help people that are in need. And Aristotle, or excuse me, Aquinas is operating from a, a, um, a, a metaphysical picture of what kind of place the world is. Uh, he assumes, and, and for him, what, when, we, when he's, he uses the word um, reality or the world, he assumes that it's created by God. So he's assuming, he's assuming the Christian metaphysical picture of what kind of place the universe is. And so for Aristotle, it's, or for, excuse me, for Aquinas, I, I, I keep confusing these two, and it's um, it's a mistake, but but it's an honest mistake, and it's because uh, Aquinas's, in some ways, his fundamental project in his philosophy was to uh, attempt to wed or to reconcile uh, those two streams, those two tributaries that I talked about, which is the Hebrew tradition on the one side and the Greek tradition on the other side. They had a sort of uneasy, uh, uneasy marriage for. Uh, well, a thousand, a thousand, over a thousand years, and Aquinas was somebody who uh, really uh, went a long way, and perhaps, arguably, he succeeded in reconciling the sort of Greek philosophical picture with the Hebrew religious picture, and ethics or religion or like the good life to live uh, to live ordered towards the good. Um, the this uh, Aquinas sort of brought those two views, which. Might, from, from the outside, they, they appear quite contradictory, right? One is basically learning how to, uh, through, through in the tradition of Plato and, and the Greeks, it's to sort of achieve insight into the good through the reason and through the intellect. Uh, for, for the Hebrews, for the Hebrew prophets, uh, basically to live the good life means uh, to basically receive, receive revelation and, and commandment from God. And it's to basically learn to... Uh, order your life and, and, and basically to follow the, the dictates of, of God. Um, Aquinas accomplished this, this feat of basically uh, weaving together those, those two, two traditions. Um, his most famous work is called the Summa Theologica. Um, in this work though, he, he again, he articulates a theory of ethics that's uh, called natural law. And the idea is, um, often we think of nature today as as um, maybe the wilderness or, or the jungle or nature as uh, the outdoors, right? Or maybe it, maybe it just means physics. Um, nature for Aquinas, uh, again, if you, you have to, in order to understand these philosophers, we have to kind of um, briefly try to, uh, with empathy or with uh, kind of sympathetic imagination, we have to be able to enter into the way they view the world, right? Um, and so, uh, and so, in some way, if, for example, um, to understand the, the Ten Commandments or the, the Hebrew prophets, um, it, it won't ha will, will be very will be limited to a very superficial, uh, a very superficial view or very superficial understanding of them, uh, as long as we uh, sort of refuse to uh, inhabit their world, uh, and it will seem it will seem. Will seem, it will perhaps seem superstitious, the views that they have, right? That the if we don't, if we don't uh, assume their worldview, we'll believe that they're kind of, um, that they're being superstitious when they, when they uh, follow the Ten Commandments, right? On the other hand, if we're able to enter into the, the, the way they think the world is, um, then uh, following the Ten Commandments would be, or, or striving to follow the Ten Commandments, because in some way they, um, they're almost impossible to fulfill all the way. They're so exacting. Um, but if we assume their worldview, trying to live up to the Ten Commandments 
will be the most reasonable thing in the world. It will be, it's the only thing that makes sense. Because if we assume, if we uh, again are able to enter with a kind of with our imagination sympathetically into the, the worldview of the Hebrew prophets, we'll, we will assume that uh, the world is created by God. God gave us these rules to live by. Um, why would I want to do anything other than that? Yeah. And we will see all of our um, every kind of uh, desire that attempts to uh, to basically draw us away from living in accordance with those commandments, we will see it as a kind of uh, a temptation, right? Um, and so, so I, the reason that I emphasize that is just to encourage us when we go through these thinkers, before we say they're wrong, well, we maybe it's like this, that before we say they're wrong, we first have um, seen how what they say can be right. Because only if we've done that have we really understood what they're saying. And so this will be kind of like a, uh, a maxim or an, uh, a maxim for, uh, for effective um, approach to all of these thinkers in the class. And, and the more we're able to live up to it, to it the richer will be our experience. I'm jumping back to uh, Aquinas. When he says nature, he doesn't just mean wilderness. He means uh, a world that was created, created by a sort of absolute uh, cause, uh, creator of the universe, God. Uh, so for Aquinas, it's not as though nature is just a kind of um, statistical accident of of, uh, of uh, mutations that uh, you know through like uh, kind of a Darwinian selective process that that um, propagates through through increasing uh, reproductive fitness through time, that it just like, if we, if we think of nature, that it's, uh, that it could have been other than it is, and, and we're seeing something like, uh, something that's a little bit haphazard, like it just happens to end up this way. Um, that's assuming, that's, that's what we might assume it from, from a, a sort of scientific standpoint from today. That's totally different than what Aquinas would have meant by the word nature. He would have meant, again, a cosmos that's uh, perfectly ordered according to the you know the, the ultimate transcendent being um, and so for Aquinas the idea is like human beings were created uh, in this perfect image and ethics means uh, to basically uh, live in harmony with that image and to order our lives so that we are uh, living according to our nature so for Aquinas, part of this nature is uh, being being uh, friendly, being sociable to people. The reason I mention that uh, that um, natural quality of, of of many different ones that that Aquinas uh, that Aquinas lists um, is that uh, the next philosopher that that I will mention, uh, who, from whom we'll read a brief excerpt in our uh, in our over the course of our our readings is Thomas Hobbes. Um, Thomas Hobbes is a very pivotal figure and a very revolutionary figure and, and the reason that I mention him or the re reason that I mention that specific uh, quality of human beings is because of what a contrast it presents to, to Hobbes's view of ethics. Um, Hobbes, uh, Thomas Hobbes was an English uh, philosopher living um, roughly in the 16th century I believe uh, and he's famous for, uh, well basically um, he, he, de he has a totally different departure point about what kind of place the world is and specifically what kind of beings human beings are. For Hobbes, uh, he assumes that human beings are basically just uh, kind of isolated, atomistic individuals. Uh, that human beings are uh, fundamentally selfish. And he describes, in fact, what he calls the state of nature. And this may be familiar to, to, to some of you who have studied political philosophy. Hobbes is famous for articulating what he calls the social contract of ethics. And it basically assumes that before this kind of agreement, this social contract, that people lived in what he calls the state of nature. And Hobbes describes the state of nature as uh, life was nasty, brutish, and short. And he has this idea that it's, it's a, a war of each against each and all against all. So uh, it's sort of every man, every woman, for him or herself, uh, we all have sort of competing interests, conflicting inter interests. And it's a question basically of, of how each 
person can 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 uh, achieve and can secure his interests at the expense of everyone else. Hobbes takes this further, and he says, uh, basically, people uh, are so selfish, but they also they're also clever enough that they're able to uh, to recognize, they're able to observe that they actually uh, are are better equipped to achieve these desires. They're better better equipped to achieve these desires if they actually, in some ways, uh, forfeit the immediate pursuit of them. Uh, they're they're better able to to achieve these desires if they enter into a social contract with other people. And so by doing that, they're sort of, uh, uh, they're sort of consenting to become social for the sake, but, for, but it's for the sake of being selfish. Now, I, the reason that I mention that is because of what a contrast it presents to Aquinas, right? So Aquinas, for Aquinas, it was kind of essentially human characteristic to be social. For Hobbes, it's something that is a kind of calculated, that human beings become social in order to secure their own, uh, their own self-interest. Yeah. And so Hobbes takes this, uh, takes this further and he says, uh, that's the function of the state. It's because we, people basically cede their autonomy to a, a sort of overarching government principle. Um, but he says people realize that they're actually, uh, their own selfish interests are uh, best off if they, they do this. And Hobbes famously calls this state the Leviathan. And so that's the name of, of Hobbes' famous treatise that, that you will read an excerpt from um, later, a little bit later in this course. Um, moving on from, from Thomas Hobbes, um, another, so a, another philosopher that is, uh, Thomas, Thomas Hobbes is, is writing, uh, just before the time of Shakespeare. We're jumping ahead, uh, maybe, um, several centuries, two centuries, to a philosopher called, um, Immanuel Kant. Thomas Hobbes was uh, writing in England, Immanuel Kant was a German. He's writing uh, in some way at the, uh, the apex of a period in European history called the Enlightenment. And this is the kind of, uh, it's the, the idea is like it's a celebration of uh, scientific and mathematical reason. So reason uh, becomes this kind of ultimate ideal during the Enlightenment period. Um, this is the period just after the scientific revolution and so there's quite a sense of optimism in uh, the ability of human reason to basically solve all of the riddles of the universe. Um, it's also on the coattails of many religious wars. There's Thirty Years' War, there's Hundred Years' War. Um, there's, a real, there's a real optimism in this time because people are, they have a, they're searching for something that can that can uh, basically overcome all of these partisan and sectarian sources of conflict. And, um, and they, the, the notion of, of reason or abstract intelligence, it gives people a sense of optimism, like this might be something that allows us to reconcile the, the rift between Protestants and Catholics, for example, which is the source of uh, you know, uh, decades and decades and decades of, of violent conflict. Um, and so ha uh, Immanuel Kant, he, um, he tries to accomplish this, uh, basically, so again, returning to the notion of that, that Arthur Schopenhauer, the, the quote from Arthur, Sch Arthur Schopenhauer, where, where it's easy to preach morality, it's very difficult to find a basis for it. Um, Kant's project and his challenge was to present reason itself as a basis for ethics. Now, um, you can probably probably imagine how what a challenge that is because it's not obvious that that we can uh, know the good and uh, or do the good, do the right thing, just by reasoning about it. Uh, we might it might seem superficially plausible, but but we only have to um, reason together with another person, uh, and I think it will become immediately apparent that uh, what we think of as reason that the next person might not think of uh, to be as reasonable. You know, the, the, the um, conclusion that we come to through reason, somebody else might not share that conclusion. And then we would have to concede that, in fact, um, 
reason is not able to provide this basis that, that we thought it might. Um, Kant, though, he really gives it a, 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 you know, quite an admirable attempt, and, and arguably he's successful. Uh, there, even today, there are many people that, that, um, uh, that believe that, that Kant's uh, formulation of ethics is, is uh, maybe the best one. Again, by best one, we don't mean that it, uh, that it exactly created, created right and wrong, or good and evil, but rather that it's, it's the clearest way to understand the basis of right and wrong, or good and evil. Okay, um, Kant's idea, of, of all of these ideas that I'm, all of these theories that I'm trying to present today, and that we will present in the whole course, Kant's is uh, among the most, um, among the most complicated, and the, it, because it's among the most abstract. And um, I don't myself pretend to be a, any kind of expert on, on Kantian ethics, but I think that I can uh, say, I think that what I say will at least give us a, um, uh, an entry point into, again, trying to view the world from, from the theory that, that Kant offers. Um, if, we think of, uh, if we think of something like the Ten Commandments, then it's very clear that, that following the Ten Commandments is good, uh, diverging or contradicting the Ten Commandments is evil. Um, but then we have a problem of, uh, what if somebody from, from a different culture uh, they don't, they don't accept the Ten Commandments, right? Then, then obviously there's going to be a conflict, and what's good for one person is evil for another person. Kant is optimistic that, uh, that in fact, this, to use the metaphor of the, the Plato's son, that in fact reason is this kind of single unifying principle that we can all find some kind of common understanding through reason. So, this is, it's quite strange, but for Kant, uh, we have to start to think of ethics from, from Kant's point of view. Ethics is not something, uh, what makes something ethical is that it's just, that it's reasonable. It's not that something is morally good or bad, uh, and we can discern that it's morally good or bad through a process of reasoning. Instead, for Kant, um, reason just is the basis for good and evil. Um, and so this is quite, uh, I think it's certainly not intuitive. If it's correct, it's, it's uh, also counterintuitive. Um, so let me try to explain. Um, now we thought of divine command theory as uh, basically following the rules of God. We thought of Pla Plato's ethics as trying to perfect one's own soul. We thought of Arist Aristotelian ethics as trying to uh, basically in, inculcate your own uh, character with uh, with virtues, uh, with virtuous uh, traits of character. Um, we thought of Aquinas's ethics as living in accordance with with natural law, with nature as created by God. We thought of Hobbes Hobbes ethics as um, recognizing recognizing the the utility of coming to contracts and to agreements amongst people recognizing the, the utility towards personal benefit of um, entering into social contracts. For Kant, we have to think of ethics as um, basically uh, respecting the law of non-contradiction. So let me try to uh, give an example of what that would mean. And this is in some ways the kind of um, proverbial example from Kant, which is um, the idea is like, we have a duty to live in accordance with reason. Um, so, so something will be ethical if we, um, insofar as that it, uh, it's, um, well, it follows the, the categorical imperative, that it, it's uh, perfectly consistent with itself. We can understand what that means by, by uh, through an example of something that's not. And this is kind of, again, something of a, uh, the kind of, um, characteristic or iconic example for Kantian ethics, which is, uh, according to Kant, um, we should never tell a lie. And we might say, well, that's pretty it's straightforward, that, that uh, it's not good to lie, but I think it probably for most of us it's just as straightforward that, that sometimes we might tell a lie, like, uh, for example, to save someone's life. For Kant, uh, that's exceptions like that. Um, 
they are not tolerable. And the reason they're not tolerable is not because of what you might think, that, I don't know, it's bad to tell a lie. That's not exactly, well, it is bad to tell a lie, but it's not for the reason that you might think, that it's just bad in itself. Or, or that it, uh, I don't know, that it's a sin or something. No, 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 for Kant, the reason that it's bad is because it's contradictory. Uh, and, and here's what I mean. It's that if I tell a lie, I'm using speech to tell the lie, and I'm basically making use of, uh, of, of this, um, you know, this power of speech to uh, controvert that very same power of speech. And so speech works. A speech is, uh, the power of speech derives from the fact that, that it's truthful, right? That we, uh, what we say, that we mean what we say. Uh, think of the, the, the converse of that, that if, if, if uh, we said what we didn't mean, or that whatever we said uh, was uh, basically a lie, that it was the opposite of what we mean, um, we couldn't have speech in the first place, and so in, we couldn't even have lies in the first place, because lies themselves depend on being exceptions to a rule. Right? Kant calls this the categorical imperative, and uh, one formulation that he gives of the categorical imperative is that he says, here's how you can test whether, wh whether what you're doing uh, is kind of controverts or flouts this you know, principle of, of, of reason. He says, uh, let everything that you do, let every action, uh, let the motive for that action be something that as you're performing it, as you're doing it, you can at, at the same time be, uh, you can at the same time, you can will that that same motive should become a, a universal motive. In other words, the reason I do something that I can, at the same time as I'm doing it, that I can have the, I can entertain the wish or the will that everyone, on everyone universally would act for the same reason. Now that's quite a high standard, standard, but uh, and and but you realize that that if if I'm telling a lie, this is this is where I, I hope that it becomes clear. Uh, if I'm telling a lie, it's impossible for me to wish that at the same time as I'm doing this, that everyone should do this. The reason that it's impossible is because, because it's again, it's self, con it's an internally contradiction, internally contradictory. It presents an internal contradiction because uh, basically I couldn't tell the lie in the first place if it weren't for the basis of most people telling the truth, right? If we always assume that somebody was lying, we couldn't lie in the first place, right? Because again, it's like, uh, it's like sawing off a branch that you're sitting on. You, you, uh, you lose your basis for sitting on that branch if you uh, saw it off. Um, this again, it's quite a, a it's quite a um, ambitious project uh, from Kant's view, which is to try to ground ethics not in anything, uh, not in any anything culturally conditioned exactly. In some ways, it is, but in some ways, it's not. It's the the idea of the basis for ethics is the kind of uh, the notion of uh, not contradicting oneself, right? So it's something, it's kind of a principle of logic or principle of reason. Kant's, uh, Kant, clearly with his ethics, he's emphasizing what is uh, sometimes called a duty. So it's like we have a, a duty to act in accordance with reason. It's also, he's also emphasizing what might be thought of as the kind of the motive for the action. So our actions, we, we have to act in a way that we, the motive for our action is at the same time, it's something that we, we uh, wish or we will to become a universal motive so that we're acting in a way that we feel that with our own motives for action, we're contributing to the, the kind of world that we would want to live in. All right. um, the next uh, ethical theorist that we'll jump to, and, and this one is often, Kant is perhaps among the most challenging of, of the, the ethicists that we'll encounter during this semester. The next eth uh, eth ethical theory or ethicist that I'm going to present is perhaps the easiest, uh, perhaps the most straightforward. Um, and the, 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 the name of this theorist is, um, well, there's two of them. And again, it's a, it's a student, uh, or a student disciple or, or um, uh, student, uh, student, uh, so teacher, student, or, or um, kind of, uh, yeah, teacher, disciple relation between these two uh, philosophers. And one of them, they're both, again, uh, 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 English, English philosophers. And one of them is uh, called Jeremy Bentham, and the other one is John Stuart Mill. And so John Stuart Mill was tutored uh, 
by Jeremy Bentham when he was uh, growing up. And so these two theorists, they're famous for uh, articulating the, the doctrine of utilitarianism, it's called. It's quite a complicated name, but it's a very straightforward uh, premise, which is that um, something is ethical insofar as the consequences of that thing uh, promote net happiness. And so you imagine there's, well, you have to imagine a, a number of things. Um, and each of these theories will, will enter into it a little bit in, in more depth as we encounter it through our reading. Uh, and utilitarianism, uh, especially, uh, it's important that we really consider it critically because it's so superficially appealing by, uh, at least from my point of view, it suffers from really extreme, uh, kind of really extreme internal, uh, internal contradictions. Um, but we, we can, we'll come to those, those discussions as, as the course progresses. Um, right now I'll just say that it, you basically, uh, you have to assume that to, for, utilit for utilitarianism, the, the, the moral, an action is evaluated according to the consequences of that, of that action. And specifically in, in the way that Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill think of it, the, the way we, we are to evaluate uh, uh, actions is to think of whether the result of that action contributes to net happiness or net pleasure, or if it detracts from net pleasure. And if it contributes to net pleasure, then it's good. If it detracts from net pleasure, then it's, um, then it's either, then it's immoral. Um, again, this seems quite straightforward. It's like you would, uh, you, you would want the, you would want to act with, uh, positive consequences. Um, the trouble is though, um, is that, well, first of all, it's not clear how we would even calculate net happiness. Um, for example, how many stakeholders are there? Like, um, do we think of, uh, people, do we think of, uh, 10 people or a hundred people? or every person that has walked on the face of the earth um, since, uh, since the origin of, of humankind, or uh, etc. Do we think of everyone that's going to be born in the future? Like what kind of, uh, more, what kind of, do future generations enter into our, our consideration of happiness? Also, is it possible that, for example, some one person can feel a greater uh, magnitude of happiness than the next person, right? If that's the case, then it would really skew your calculations. You couldn't just I don't know, you couldn't just count the number of people, you would have to also some, find some way of measuring the intensity of, 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 of someone's pleasure, right? Uh, do we think of animals in this calculus, right? Uh, also, it's like, um, you know, with, uh, if we think of something like, well, ethics is helping us, it's, it's trying to help us understand um, how to live. Um, and I, I introduced this, this in the last lecture of how ethics differs from from other subjects we might study. Um, other subjects, we have the facts somewhat arrayed before us, and our job is to kind of um, observe the facts and then uh, attempt to make sense of those facts. Um, ethics is partly that way, but it's also, um, we're also creating those facts. Like those facts don't, don't exist, because the facts are our, well, our actions, our acts create those facts. And so ethics, if we have a, you know, a, 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 a useful uh, and a true theory of ethics, it will have to, um, it will have to uh, guide us in creating those facts through our acts. So it will have to guide us on the level of act and not only help us, uh, uh, not only help us observe and, and, and order and, and organize facts that are already, that just confront us from outside. Now, uh, it's clear that something like, just to contrast um, utilitarianism to Kantian ethics, it's clear that Kant is addressing that problem because he's, he's approaching ethics from the perspective of what is my motive and can I will that that motive should be everyone's motive, right? the motive that I'm acting from, that I'm not acting in a way that I'm trying to make an exception for myself. Right? This is another way to think about Kantian ethics is Never make an exception for yourself. Like you would do one thing, and then but you would expect everyone else to do something for a different reason. Because that the reason not to do that is because it contradicts the principle of of it contradicts the principle of reason. Uh, um, 
for for uh, for utilitarian ethics for John Stuart Mill, um, the emphasis is no longer on the reason for acting or the motive for acting. In fact, that doesn't even come into the equation. Um, for John Stuart Mill, the, the 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 emphasis is placed on the consequences of um, our actions. Um, again, this seems quite uh, quite straightforward. It's like we want to act in a way that that leads to positive positive consequences. Um, but it's it's more problematic than it might seem because in order to um, well in order to uh, evaluate the moral worth of something, uh, if we're going to evaluate it according to its consequences, we have to have those consequences there before us so that we can make this evaluation. Um, but clearly, uh, in order to produce those consequences, we have to already have acted. Right? And so it, it, uh, it's really not helpful at all because I don't know what the consequences of my action will be at, at the time of my performing it. I have to somehow wait till I've already performed it to discover the consequences and then retrospectively, uh, then in retro only retrospectively can I know that what I did was uh, contributed to net happiness or diminished it. This is, um, well, clearly, um, clearly if I have to wait until after the fact um, to, to measure if what I did or not, it's not going to give me much guidance um, in, in, in how to live my life. Right? Um, in some way, it's, it's always um, just, just one step behind where, where it could actually be useful. Um, I won't, you know, it, oh, as the uh, once we once we come to uh, come to uh, to read Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, um, there's of course uh, many sides to this, and, and we could go much deeper into any one of these theorists. Um, but I do, uh, I I hope that what I said at least at least gives a um, can give us a gives us a picture of of um, what utilitarianism, for example, has to offer, and also what the, um, what the difficulties with it might be. And, and perhaps we can resolve those difficulties. Um, but I do uh, think it's important to, to uh, pr present them together with the theory itself. Um, now, in some way, so uh, one reason, uh, just to return to a, a point that I made at the outset of this video, um, one reason that utilitarianism is so influential is because it is so, um, it's so, it lends itself to such easy articulation. It's basically just like, uh, do whatever leads, do whatever leads to greater happiness or greater pleasure, really. Um, and so, but again, just because it, just because it's influential or just because it's easy to, it's easily, easy to articulate, it doesn't ne necessarily mean that it's, that it's the best. Um, this is a this is a question that we can we can again we can pose and we can uh, we can investigate as the course goes on. Um, there is uh, in the uh, after in, in, in roughly the middle of the of the course we will um, we will well let me just finish by by co by coming to Nietzsche because because Nietzsche lived um, within a century of um, John Stuart Mill. So in some ways, with Nietzsche, I will, we will conclude this, um, it's kind of like a, a segment. And again, I presented Plato on one end and Nietzsche on the other end. And, and the reason that they, 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 they sort of conveniently form these, these antithetical viewpoints, right? So Plato, again, um, uh, espousing the, the kind of uh, ideal uh, picture of the, the sort of transcendent and unitary and universal good. Um, Nietzsche kind of, uh, kind of articulating the opposite viewpoint, which is, um, he, he, again, he, he, he plays on Plato's metaphors and he says, uh, what were we thinking when we unchained this earth from the sun? Um, are we not, do we not feel the breath of empty space? Are we not drifting as though into an infinite nothingness? Do we not need to light candles in the morning? And so he gives a picture of, of kind of uh, darkness, right? Plato is a, pic a picture in the light. Um, these, uh, you know, at the same time, in Plato's, from in Plato's view of what kind of place the world is, you have an earth, uh, and you have 
the sun, right? And there's just one sun. Uh, 2,000 years later, um, we have discovered uh, not only is the, uh, is the Earth, you know, orbiting the sun, uh, but the sun itself is just one of one single star of, of you know, billions of billions of stars and, and galaxies and, 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 and light years, right? And so in some way, Nietzsche is, the reason that I uh, presented Nietzsche as kind of like a, a um, uh, sounding the keynote or something like the prophet of the time that we actually find ourselves in today is just because he, in some way, he, he, um, he uh, foresaw this kind of, the view that we, li that we the, the, the kind of metaphysical underpinnings of what kind of place we think the universe is today, which is, again, the Earth is kind of viewed as a, a sort of cosmic uh, dust speck in, in infinite space. Um, it's very hard to, to imagine that there's some kind of um, transcendent good uh, Right, like an ultimate, ultimate principle of value, if we um, from that that point of view, and, and so Nietzsche again, he just uh, he, with such um, in such evocative and, and and poetic images, he he conveys this sentiment that is kind of it's the in some way it's throwing down the gauntlet for us, and it's a challenge that we we're, we're confronted with. We have to meet it. Um, we can't just assume. Uh, it, it's very difficult to to uh, well again we we, we no longer. We live in a pluralistic society. We no longer uh, share this kind of homogeneity that is that is characteristic of smaller and more tribal societies. We, we see this today. We have uh, in global, we have such communication amongst all different cultures of the globe that that we assume that 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 people have different views of, of what kind of place the world is. Um, we won't exactly though in our uh, in our class. Uh, we won't end with Nietzsche, and there are many contemporary philosophers that, that we'll be reading with, or w that we'll be reading in our book. Um, that being said, most of them fall pretty squarely within the categories that, that these philosophers of the past, up to Nietzsche, have, um, have delineated. There are a number of, of uh, virtue ethicists, there are a number of, uh, so Kantian ethicists, this is also known as deontology, just refers to a kind of ethics based on duty, so duty to conform to uh, the, the dictates of reason. A number of uh, utilitarians as well, um, and there are, there are critics of each of these, these camps, but these, in some way, most of the, the contemporary ethics organizes itself according to these, these basic uh, uh, schemata that are out, uh, outlined by the philosophers that we've already covered. I will just um, mention one one final uh, philosopher that, that doesn't fall very neatly in any one of these categories, and, and we will in fact have the, the opportunity to, to uh, read uh, uh, some of his uh, writings and, and to, uh, to discuss and, and to consider uh, this, uh, this, this other um, moral theory that, again, it doesn't fall squarely in, in, one, of the, uh, in one of them that we've outlined to this point. Uh, the philosopher's name is Rudolf Steiner, and uh, his, um, in some way his the uh, again in the spirit of or uh, you know confronting the question that Schopenhauer posed, which is, it's one thing to preach morality, but how do you find the basis for it? Uh, Rudolf Steiner offers the uh, the approach uh, that basically sees the basis of ethics as um, human freedom, and so um, so an, uh, when we talk about what is good or what is moral, what is ethical. Um, the way we uh, the way we measure whether something is moral is uh, whether it uh, uh, to take a given action for example it's whether we ask whether that action kind of flowed forth from the wellspring of freedom or whether it uh, is the kind of um, whether it's something that we're doing under compulsion um, to go to go back to Plato uh, most of those compulsions would in fact not be from the outside. In fact, we're very vigilant about being compelled from the outside, and uh, especially as Americans, we have a sort of allergy or an instinctual aversion to external compulsion. We feel it's an infringement on our liberty. This kind of extroverted orientation, uh, it reveals, it, it makes us, again, especially perceptive of some things, but it, in some way it, it distracts us or it blinds us, makes us less perceptive to other things, 
and what, what Rudolf Steiner is really pointing to with the notion of freedom, it has much less to do with being compelled by some external force. It has much more to do with this uh, play, <clears throat> with sort of Platonic, with Plato's notion of the um, the free or the the, the well ordered, the, the the harmonious soul, and so Rudolf Steiner's notion has much more to do with um, whether I'm being whether my action is being compelled by a desire that is in, in some way um, I've kind of assumed it or adopted it as my own, but in some way it's actually um, foreign to me. Like like it's um it's something that I want, but I but it's but it's not um, well it's something that I uh, in some way it's it, it's insinuated itself into my um, my my uh, my my motives or my um, my desires or, or this desire has kind of um, I picture it's like putting on a disguise and pretending to be my own but in fact it, it it's something that if I if I were able to uh, distance myself from it I wouldn't actually be very um, be very pleased with this desire I uh, we will have occasion to to uh, to really try to understand um, and, and explore what, what he's saying with this, but basically the notion is um, if I act for a reason uh, that I'm conscious of, this for Rudolf Steiner is, uh, he believes, can provide a, a basis for, for ethics. Um, that is both, uh, that's not, you know, any of the ethical theories you can imagine, they would become very rigid and kind of uh, stifling, constraining, constricting. Uh, Rudolf Steiner attempts to avoid that, so he uh, tries to present an ethical theory that's, on the one side, that's not constraining, but then on the other side, it's not. Um, it still gives us some kind of, uh, some kind of positive and 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 um, and clear and uh, concrete way of of measuring, uh, or or basically determining or evaluating uh, moral action. Now. Um, that's probably a good place to stop because I've, uh, again, I think I've outlined quite a substantial number of different theories, and um, I, uh, I, uh, this is again in some ways an introduction to all these theories. So um, the purpose with this video is not to have, um, not to have investigated each one, but in some way to uh, to picture them kind of uh, arranged before us, and so that as we go through the semester, uh, we will encounter these these theories that uh, we've already. Uh, you know, heard heard a little bit about today, and so I will end the video now. And and uh, best wishes to each of you, and I look forward to um, our future discussions.